Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. My name is Jessica. I'm the director of the Planetarium, and with me tonight are three of our students, who I will let say hi and introduce themselves, and we'll start with Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm a biology and environmental science student at UMD. Hey, I'm Brayden. I'm a music education major here at UMD. I'm Eli. I'm a physics and astronomy student here at UMD. All right, so for our show tonight, uh, since last month we took a tour of the planets of the solar system, this month we're taking a look at the moons of the solar system, because there are some very interesting ones. Um, dare I say some that are even more interesting than some of the planets. Um, so before we get going with our show, as always, if you have any questions throughout the show tonight, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Uh, Eli is going to be keeping an eye on that for me and will let me know when questions pop up. Um, if we don't get to your question right away, um, don't worry, we will take time to answer your questions at the end of the show as well. So with all of that said, let's start our tour of the moons of our solar system. Now we are starting off here at the Earth, not just because it's where we live, but if we're going in order of the planets from closest to the sun to furthest from the sun, the Earth is actually the first planet that we would come to that has a moon. Mercury doesn't and Venus also does not have a moon. So we're starting with Earth because it's the first one to have one. And as I kind of zoom on out here, we can get a look at the moon's orbit around the Earth. You can see it is a pretty good distance away. It's about um, 30 Earth diameters away. So basically it would take 30 Earths lined up side by side to get you from the Earth to the moon. Uh, now, from this distance out, the moon looks pretty small, uh, so we are going to head on over there and take a close-up look at it. And here is our moon. Now, our moon is kind of weird in the sense that it is a lot bigger compared to the size of the Earth than other moons are compared to the size of their planet. In general, when we see moons in our solar system, they are much, 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 much smaller than the planets that they orbit around. The moon is only about a fourth of the size of the Earth, which is pretty big. And that has led to a lot of questions about how exactly we got our moon, because it does deviate from the norm. It is a lot bigger than moons are compared to the size of their planets. Now, we'll come back to that in just a second. Now, as we look at the moon, um, you see it's covered in uh, gray rock. Um, it is a just big ball of rock orbiting around the Earth. But we see two different gray colors. The lighter colored, oops, this way, is what we call the lunar highlands. And if we were able to look really close up in detail, we would see that the lunar highlands is absolutely covered in craters. In fact, it's said that there are so many craters in the highlands that you can't create a new crater without destroying one that's already there. It's just covered in them. And most of these craters actually date back to the very early solar system about 3.5 billion years ago during a time period that we call the heavy bombardment period. This was the time when there was just a lot of stuff in the solar system. Planets and moons were forming. They were collecting up all of this debris, and that led to a lot of impacts. And so most of our craters that we see on not just the moon, but all solid surfaces in the solar system, most of the craters date back to that time period. Now, there are ones that have been more recent, um, and you can usually tell a more recent crater, let me go down here, like this one right here, you can usually tell a more recent crater because it's much lighter in color than its surroundings. That's because material on the surface of the moon tends to darken with time when exposed to sunlight. What we're seeing here is fresh material that was dug up 
by the impact and then spewed and sprayed across the surface of the moon. So we're seeing that kind of pristine material that was under the surface and has been brought up. And so we, um, those are relatively, relatively, we're still talking probably the past, you know, 10, maybe 100 million years. Um, but in astronomical geological terms, that's, that's pretty recent. Now, I mentioned that things darken when exposed to sunlight, um, which may lead you to wonder, well, what about this huge dark area that we're seeing on the moon? Is that the same thing? And it's actually not. This is darker area is uh, the other part of the moon that we call the lunar maria. Maria is Latin for sea, a body of water. And this stems from a time before telescopes. When people looked up at the moon, they saw these big dark spots, and they thought, huh, that kind of looks like water. So they called them seas. Um, now we know that that's not the case. They are rocks, but they are a much darker color rock than the highlands are. Also, the highlands are called the highlands because they sit at a higher elevation than the maria. The maria sit at a lower elevation. So this darker color rock that makes up the maria is actually basalt, a lava rock. And so that tells us that the lunar maria are actually ancient lava flows, where way back, right after that heavy bombardment period that created all of these craters, or most of the craters on the surface of the moon, Back in that time, the interior of the moon was still hot, and hot enough for there to be liquid rock. Well, with all these impacts that cracked the surface, that led to cracks opening up that that molten rock could then find and move up to the surface, where it then flooded the surface, um, filled in any craters that were there, just like we fill in potholes in the road, and then it cooled and hardened into this dark Maria that we see today, this dark basalt rock. Uh, and that's where we got the Lunar Maria. That's also why when you look at pictures of the Maria, you don't see as many craters because the lava flows filled in the craters that were there. So it basically repaved the surface. Now, back to why our moon is so big. Now, for a lot of moons that we're going to see tonight, a lot of them were captured. They didn't form around their planet. We don't think that's the case for our moon because of how big it is. But we also don't think that it necessarily formed with the Earth as the Earth was forming, because we would expect the two to be much more similar or to have similarities in their composition that we don't see. There are similarities, but not enough to point to them forming together from exactly the same material. So our current hypothesis for how our moon formed has a fantastic name. It's called the Large Impact Hypothesis, which literally means we think that something about the size of Mars that formed elsewhere in the solar system hit Earth, that um, ejected a lot of material into space around the Earth, and that material then collected together and formed the moon. Now, some of that material that was ejected out was Earth material, which is why the moon does have some similarities in its composition to what the Earth is made of, but not exactly the same. So that is our, our current hypothesis for how the moon formed, and that explains also why it is as big as it is, because there was just a lot of material that was ejected out by this impact. All right, I've spent a lot of time on our moon. There's so much to talk about, um, but we are going to head on now to other planets in our solar system um, that have moons as well. And next up is Mars, the red planet. Why are you not? Hold on. There we go. Okay. So Mars here has two moons. The innermost moon is Phobos and the outermost is Deimos. Uh, now we are going to go take a look at Phobos. 
And we can see that it looks quite a bit different than our moon. Yes, it's a, a chunk of rock in space, but it's not a nice big sphere like the moon is. It is very small and it's very oddly shaped. I, I lovingly call it a lumpy space potato. Um, now, based off of its size and its shape, we actually think that both Phobos and Deimos were once asteroids that lived in the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter. And that kind of makes sense. Mars is right on the edge of the asteroid belt. So these just happen to be two asteroids that got a little bit too close to Mars and Mars's gravity was able to grab onto them and they started orbiting around Mars instead of orbiting around the sun and therefore they became moons. And that is how we got Phobos and Deimos around Mars. Now, as we, we fly out from here, you can really see just how small it is compared to Mars. Um, and poor Phobos is in for quite a fate. Um, it's actually close enough to Mars that Mars's gravity is gradually pulling it in. So eventually, it's either going to get ripped to shreds if that gravitational tidal force from Mars becomes stronger than the um, structural integrity of the rock that make up the moon. If that's stronger, it'll rip it to shreds. Um, and if it's not, then it'll just spiral in and hit Mars. Um, so we've got probably a couple hundred million years before we find out what's going to happen there. But Phobos is not always going to be there. Okay, so heading on now to our next planet, we are going to head out, there we go, um, past the asteroid belt to Jupiter, the first of our outer planets. And before we even get close to the planet, you can already see so many orbit lines. Jupiter at current count has 80 moons. Now, most of these are lumpy space potatoes. Most of these are captured asteroids, which again makes sense because Jupiter is on the other side of the asteroid belt. Jupiter is also a very big, massive planet with a lot of gravity, a lot more gravity than Mars has, which makes it a lot easier for it to grab hold of an asteroid and pull it into orbit around itself rather than staying in orbit around the sun. Um, so we have lots and lots and lots of these lumpy space potato moons around Jupiter. Now, not all of Jupiter's moons are captured objects. In fact, the four largest moons, which we call the Galilean moons, because the astronomer Galileo was the first to discover them, um, we actually think formed around Jupiter as Jupiter formed in kind of like a mini solar system fashion. Um, and these are some very interesting moons. So the first Galilean moon that we're going to go see is Io. It's the innermost of the Galilean moons. And as we fly on in, we'll see that it looks quite a bit different than our moon. Um, Io here has this very interesting color structure to it. Because of the color, um, we at the Planetarium have nicknamed it the Pizza Moon. Um, if you've been to any of our moon shows before, you have probably heard me and Eli argue over what these dark spots are. And actually, you know what? I'm going to do this because we have two new people here tonight. Okay, so I think the dark spots are sausage on the pizza because that's what should go. Eli says they're olives, which is gross. So, Brayden, Rachel, I'm putting you on the spot. What are you, team sausage or team olive? They look more like olives, but I would prefer having sausage on my pizza than olives. I'm, I'm, so. I'm taking team sausage there. Okay. I think I'm gonna have to go. I think I'm gonna have to go with the same answer. I'm sorry. Vindicated. Vindicated. <laughs> Whatever. I can't see Eli's face. So I have no idea. <laughs> 
Okay, okay. Getting off track here. Um, these dark spots that we're seeing, um, while serve a very hilarious debate amongst the planetarium, are actually really interesting features. Because all of these dark specks that you're seeing are volcanoes, active volcanoes. Io has over 150 active volcanoes, more than anything else in the solar system. And that is incredibly strange because Io is just a little bit bigger than our moon. And our moon doesn't have any active volcanoes, let alone hundreds of them. So that raised a lot of questions of how can such a small body the size of the moon still have so much heat and energy inside to uh, run and to, um, yeah, we'll say run, um, all of these volcanoes all over the surface. And it turns out the culprit to all this, I'm trying to orient here, yes, is Jupiter. So... Jupiter and the other moons around it are playing sort of a tug of war with Io. You've got Jupiter on one side pulling it, pulling Io towards it. You have all of the other moons on the other side pulling Io out to the other direction. And this back and forth tug of war is stretching Io out. And as it orbits around Jupiter, how much it's getting stretched back and forth changes. And so that means Io is getting stretched and then it's able to relax some. And then it stretches back out and is able to relax. And that stretching in and out actually causes the interior to rub together. And just like you do to warm your hands on a cold day, when those rocks rub together, they heat up. And that generates an enormous amount of energy because of how much Io is being stretched back and forth. And that is more than enough to create all of these active volcanoes all over the surface of Io. It's also where the yellow color comes from. Um, that is sulfur covering the surface. Um, so if we are going with our pizza uh, illustration here, um, the more accurate depiction would be a rotten egg pizza which I think even Eli would agree with me that that does not sound pleasing at all. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> all right, so our next uh, Galilean moon that we're going to go see is Europa. Now, Europa, at first sight, may not look quite as interesting as Io. We see a surface that is covered in ice, we see that the ice has these cracks in it, kind of looks like someone's been ice skating across the surface. Um, but those cracks tell us that just like Io, Europa is also in this tug of war and being stretched and shrunk and stretched and released. Not quite as much as Io though, because it's a little bit further away from Jupiter. So that stretching effect isn't as strong, but that is still generating heat. And even though, because we have, sorry, because we have ice on the surface, um, and we see when we kind of study the composition of Europa, we see that there is a lot of water. Well, when you have water ice introduced to heat, you get liquid water. So underneath this icy crust, we actually think there is a huge ocean of liquid water. And I mean huge. Estimates um, show that there could be twice as much water in this ocean than we have on the entirety of Earth. That is giant. And of course, because uh, it has to be heated up through this process, there's got to be uh, underwater kind of thermal vents, very similar to what we find at the bottom of Earth's oceans. And all of this is incredibly exciting to astronomers and scientists because these match the conditions of what we think life developed in here on Earth. We think the very first life on Earth formed deep under the ocean around uh, thermal vents. And so with those conditions, that means Europa could possibly have life in that ocean. And this is one of our best targets to try and find life elsewhere in our solar system. 
And that's why uh, we have lots of new missions that are in the works to go to Europa, study it more, and eventually land on it uh, and explore that ocean below. And I really want it to happen in my lifetime because I want to know that there are alien fish on Europa. I just, I have to know. Okay, I always do this. I always run out of time with the show. Um, so very quickly, um, the last two of Jupiter's Galilean moons. Um, next up we have Ganymede, which wins the prize for largest moon in the solar system. Uh, it is actually larger than the planet Mercury and about three-fourths the size of the planet Mars. It is a giant of a moon. Now it is also like Europa covered in a crust of ice a much thicker crust of ice, but we do think there might be a very thin ocean deep down under that crust. We're not entirely certain of that, um, but we do see some possibility for that. Otherwise, it's mostly just a ball of rock covered in a very thick layer of ice. And then the last of our Galilean moons is Callisto which compared to especially Io and Europa, and then you have Ganymede, the giant of a moon, Callisto is a little boring. Um, it's just a ball of rock and ice mixed together. Um, and we see lots and lots and lots of craters all over its surface, just like we saw on the highlands of the moon. Um, so yeah, that's, that's little Callisto. And those are the Galilean moons of Jupiter. All right, so next we are going to head on over to Saturn, which before we even get close, again, we see lots of moons. Saturn does have more moons than Jupiter. It has 82 of them. Most of them, again, lumpy space potatoes, either captured asteroids or captured comets. But just like Jupiter, Saturn does also have some larger moons that we think formed around it as the planet formed in a mini solar system fashion. Now, the largest of Saturn's moons is also probably the most interesting of its moons, and that is Titan. So Titan is the second largest moon in our solar system. Um, right behind Ganymede. Uh, it is also larger than the planet Mercury at about three-fourths the size of the planet Mars. And it is a very peculiar moon. And you may notice as we're looking at it here that it looks fuzzy, hazy. That's because it has an atmosphere. It's the only moon in our solar system to have an atmosphere. And that atmosphere is actually thicker than Earth's. It's about one and a half times the density of Earth's atmosphere at the surface. And because of that thick atmosphere, there are clouds which block our view of the surface. So until the Cassini spacecraft got out to Saturn, we actually didn't know what Titan looked like. Now, Cassini had um, cameras, radar uh, cameras, that it could peer through the clouds and see the surface, but it also carried with it the Huygens probe, which descended through Titan's atmosphere and landed on its surface and gave us all sorts of fantastic images and information about the surface of this little moon. So um, with the magic of technology, I can turn off those clouds and show you what the surface of Titan looks like. And it is interesting. Um, what's specifically very strange is around the poles, you can see these dark splotches. That's actually liquid, not liquid water. It's far too cold out here for this to be liquid water. Those are lakes of liquid methane. Titan is the only other object in our solar system to have liquid of some sort on its surface. The other, of course, being Earth covered in liquid water on its surface. So Titan is just a peculiar moon. It has an atmosphere. It has liquid on its surface. It has a lot of features that resemble 
earth type of features. They're just, you know, instead of having a water precipitation cycle, you have a methane precipitation cycle. And you see uh, stream beds um, and erosion features because of that. Um, and it's just, it's peculiar, but also very similar to some of the things we see on Earth. Um, so it, it's a great moon, and that's why we are sending another mission out there, Dragonfly, which is actually a quadcopter, because there's an atmosphere, you can fly through it. Um, so this little guy is going to uh, fly around Titan and tell us even more information about it. In particular, we're interested in studying the areas around these methane lakes, because we know on Earth, life, all life needs liquid water in some way. That doesn't necessarily mean all life everywhere in the universe has to rely on liquid water. Maybe there's a form of life that relies on liquid methane instead. That could have developed on Titan. We don't know, but we definitely want to find out. All right. Um, before heading away from Saturn, because I can't help it, um... Another really great moon around Saturn is Enceladus, which is basically Saturn's version of Jupiter's Europa. Um, Enceladus is but smaller than Europa, um, but it is covered in ice, and underneath that ice, we think there is an ocean of liquid water. So it's another good uh, candidate for searching for potential life. Um, but Europa is still kind of our first choice. One, because it's closer to us. It's easier to get to because Jupiter's closer. Also, the ocean itself um, on Europa is closer to the surface. The one on Enceladus is covered, it is deeper underneath the ice. Um, and so it would be a little bit harder to get to. But it is another candidate for potential sources of life. And then one last moon um, around... Saturn that is really just a tiny little moon, but we love it because of its nickname. And let me turn us around here and see if I can find... I think I'm going to have to fast forward time here. Uh, I have to remember how to fast forward time. There we go. There we go. Okay. Been a while since I've used this program. <laughs> Where is it at? There we go. So this is Mimas, um, which is nicknamed the Death Star Moon. Because of this giant crater, uh, it resembles the Death Star. And that's all I'm going to say about that, because Eli and Brayden can fill in any Star Wars facts or mythos for you that I cannot. All right. Um, I am running low on time as I always do. So very quickly, let's head on out to our next planet, Uranus. Now, not as many moons as Jupiter and Saturn. We're looking at about, I believe it's 24 moons around Uranus. Um, some of these are captured things, probably comets. Um, some of them possibly formed around Uranus. Um, the trouble is we don't really know a lot about Uranus or Neptune because they're so far away from the Earth. They're incredibly difficult to study. And because we've only had one spacecraft fly by, which was Voyager 2 in the 1980s, we just don't have a lot of information. Um, and most of the moons that we know of um, were found when Voyager 2 flew by. Um, so it's got, you know, a couple of tens of moons. Um, some of them may be formed around Uranus. A lot of them were probably captured comets. Um, but we don't know too terribly much about them, unfortunately. So that leaves us with our last planet, Neptune which has, I believe, 17 moons. Um, and the largest moon around Neptune is the most interesting, and that is the moon Triton, which I always used to get confused with Saturn's Titan. 
Saturn is Titan, Neptune is Triton. Now, what's particularly strange about Triton is the way it orbits around Neptune. When we look at all of the other large and medium-sized moons around the other planets, they all orbit the planet in the same direction the planet rotates. And they all orbit around kind of the equator. All of their orbits are lined up with the equator of the planet. That's how we, it's one of the clues that tells us they formed around the planets in a mini solar system fashion. Triton, on the other hand, orbits Neptune in the opposite direction that Neptune rotates, which is a key indicator that it did not form here, it was actually captured. So we think Triton is the largest captured moon in the solar system, and that it once lived out in the Kuiper Belt, where Pluto is. And this is interesting and exciting because this gives us another look at what Kuiper Belt objects are like. They're, the Kuiper Belt and the things that live in it are very small. They're almost impossible to study from here on Earth. Um, because of how small they are and how far away they are, and we just don't have a lot of information. So having this moon a little bit closer to us um, gives us another kind of data point that we can use to study what the Kuiper Belt was like. Um, it also has an interesting texture. Um, this area right here looks like the skin of a cantaloupe, so it's called the cantaloupe terrain. All right. Um, so I think we will stop there. I'm only a few minutes over. That's fine, right? Um, and we will fly ourselves back to Earth. Back home, safe and sound. And I will bring us back over to the Zoom window. All right. So that was our tour of the moons of the solar system. Um, did we have any questions, Eli? Um, no, not that I can see. I'm a bit worried that nothing showed up based because of what you were experiencing, but as if, if that's not affecting me, then no, we don't have any questions. It shouldn't affect you. Um, yeah, I don't know if for anyone, um, my, my usual view of the stream through Facebook is not showing me what it normally does. Um, so I can't see any comments at all. So we're like a little concerned that maybe comments just aren't working or we're not able to see them. Um, I think they're still working, but yeah, I, I don't fully know what's going on with my Oh, view. yes. Okay. I did just see a comment now. So Okay, cool. Thank we're you, good. Mom for letting us know that comments are working. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, so, since there were no questions throughout, um, if you guys do have any questions, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments now that we know comments are working and we can see them. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna put you guys on the spot again. What's, what's your favorite moon? I'll go. Um, so this might surprise. Uh, for me, it's Titan, actually. I'm uh, so I'm actually just a huge Marvel fan. And one of the in in Marvel Comics, Titan is a big moon where a bunch of uh, celestial aliens come from. And it's really, really cool. That's right. And so that's just that's why I have a big love for Titan, just because I'm a nerd. <laughs> I felt for sure it was gonna be my miss. I really did. No, I don't get me wrong. I that's up there, but the Titan <laughs> is gotta love a lot of love for it. I'm gonna be honest. I don't have a, any strong feelings towards any moons, but I will say I like the um, oh shoot, what's the the last ones that we saw? I like the colors on that one. Oh, Triton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like I like that. And that, like, reddish color that we see on it, we also see on Pluto. 
um, which is really cool, just showing more similarities between these Kuiper Belt objects. Um, so we got two questions. Um, are Enceladus and Europa similar? I would say pretty. Pretty, pretty similar, close. yeah. Um, especially considering the breadth of uh, different moons we have out there. Um, the next one is, uh, is there going to be another stream to show more of Jupiter and Saturn's moons? Ooh, um, we don't have anything planned, but if you're interested, we could add that to our potential list of topics for the exploration series. So we could do a exploring Jupiter's moons, exploring Saturn's moons, and look even more at those. That could be cool. Because there's definitely a lot that we didn't get to with those two sets of moons. They do, um, they're really tied to like the ring systems around the planets and there's a lot of really cool stuff there. So I will, <laughs> okay, I will, I will add that to our list of exploration topics. So that should, um, it won't be next month, but probably the next after, the month after we can get to that. So we've already got next month's planned. Cool. All right, well, speaking of, um, let me tell you what's coming up um, this week. Uh, so on Saturday is the next edition of our, wait, no, that is wrong. Why is that one showing? I have the wrong image loaded. I know what happened. It replaced when I resaved for next month's. So that was next month's. Um, this month on Saturday, um, our next exploration show is going to be Dwarf Planets, uh, which is really an excuse for me to play, uh, talk about Pluto. Um, so that's what we'll be doing on Saturday. Um, and our schedule for next week has not come out yet because I'm still waiting on one last piece to come together before we can officially announce that we are opening for public shows in March. I'm so excited. Um, so, because you guys are here and we love our Facebook fam, um, for anyone who wasn't here Saturday where I already spilled the beans because I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't wait. Um, starting in March, we are going to be opening for public shows again. Um, so we will only be doing our streams on Wednesdays and then we'll be doing public shows in the planetarium on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, and I am just waiting for the last bit of our online ticketing system to get finished, which should be any day now. And as soon as that's done, all of the information is going to drop. You're going to be able to, to see our schedule and tickets. And we're so excited and just cannot wait to have everyone back in. It's been, it's been two years. And I'm beyond ecstatic to have people come back in. Um, is this how shows in the planetarium are run? Kind of. I and mean, one of the big differences is it's projected on the dome, so you're kind of immersed in the imagery. Um, but a lot of our shows are presented live, so it would be someone with the planetarium talking uh, and giving the show. Um, but we do also have some shows that are pre-recorded. Um, and those are usually our Saturday shows. Um, so you get kind of a mix of those. All right. Well, I think we will wrap it up there. So thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed this look at the moons of the solar system. Um, yeah, like I said, look out for exciting announcements that you now already know but full details coming very soon um literally we have like one piece left to finalize and and that's it um yeah thank you guys have a wonderful rest of your evening and we'll see you next time bye everyone <laughs>